Today, we're going to be kicking off a new series where we're going to look at what happens to every single one of us the moment that we die. And I know even looking at this ominous, ominous image for some of you is a little bit uncomfortable. For some of you, death is a really scary subject. There are people who hate to talk about death. When the conversation comes up, they want to leave the room or they want to change the subject. They make re, uh, excuses and reasons to skip attending funerals. There's always something that they have to be at because they just don't want to be there and have to face that sense that all of us have a last day on this earth. They're unwilling to make any plans for their own eventual death, leaving all those details into the hands of their children who have to figure everything out. And if that's you, before we begin this series, I do want to give you a little bit of hope. As we go through this three-week series looking at life after death, you have to understand that death doesn't mean done. Okay? Death doesn't mean that everything that you have worked for on this earth is completely over. Yes, your physical body comes to an end, but there's so much more left for you to experience as you pass over from this life to the next. And so that's what this series is going to be unpacking. On the other hand, for some reason, death has become really popular in our culture almost. There's this fascination with death. There's all sorts of horror movies that love to show people dying in gruesome ways. Even turning on CBS, there's all sorts of crime shows where in the first five minutes, somebody's dead. Dun -dun. And then they saw, spend the rest of the time figuring out how they were killed. But there's always some gruesome murder that goes on. We've got crime podcasts that people love to listen to right now. Our video games are filled with shootings. And, you know, you get your high score by killing the most people or creatures or whatever it is that you're shooting to cause their death. Our local news always seems to carry anybody who dies young or prematurely. There's a special story on their life. It's like we have this preoccupation with, well, what actually happens when I go from breathing to not, when my heart goes from beating to not. The problem is there's so much bad information out there. And so people believe a very wide assortment of beliefs about what happens when people die. And unfortunately, Christians, if left uninformed and naive, will tend to believe these same things that are said. I once heard in a funeral, a little girl passed away way too young, and the pastor said she saw a butterfly and thought that was God's gift that this little girl visited her as a butterfly. And I thought to myself, that's not scriptural. So things that we're not going to talk about, misconceptions that people hold that are nowhere found in Scripture are things like the idea that when you die, you become an angel. It's not biblical. You also don't become a butterfly or a cardinal. Apparently, that's a real popular belief that you become a cardinal and you hang outside the window of your family and friends. St. Peter is not going to meet you at the pearly gates and then determine whether you get to come in or not. It makes for a lot of great jokes, but it's not what's actually going to happen. And your grandma, who passed away years ago, is not floating around this earth as a spirit without a body trying to communicate with you. Yes, there are spirits who interact with us on this world, but they are categorically created as spirits. They are demons and angels and the Holy Spirit. That's what communicates with us, but nowhere in Scripture do we see people flying through the air as spirits and communicating with their family members in their old houses. For our next three weeks, we are going to be trying to unpack the truth of what the Bible tells us happens when we die. And before we begin, I want to give credit to Craig Grishel. He's a pastor who preached a series very similar to the one that I was preparing for several years back. So as I was researching for this and I had an idea for a three-week series and what happens when you die, I came across his and I listened to his message and I thought, that is very helpful. So a lot of my outline is based on the flow that he put together today. So as we launch into... Ex our exploration of what Scripture says happens when we die. 
We're going to first begin by looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It's a lengthy passage, so if you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to open that up right now. So in 2 Corinthians, it's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. It's probably the third letter that he wrote to them. But he's explaining to them a whole bunch here. He's unpackaging what happens when you die. And he begins in verse 1, and I'm using the NLT translation, which I don't normally use here, because it smooths out some parts that are very symbolic, and it makes them a little clearer for our purposes. But this is what it says. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave our earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies and we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. So raise your hand if you ever get tired of waking up with aches, pains, and groaning. It's a few of us. I hit 40 and it hit me and I was told I've got this for the rest of the downhill slope of life. That's why they say you're over the hill at 40. I think that's because of the aches and the pains. But imagine a day when you will wake up and you will open your eyes and you will see clearly and you will hear clearly and your aches and your pains will be gone And the body that you have will be perfect and restored and a new kind of glory, not worn out, not tired. Your body will no longer hurt. And putting that body on is going to make you feel a lot better than the coolest shirt that you, you know, that one you had to have. Like that's kind of what Paul talks about there. We long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. When you're excited, I've got this new shirt, I'm going to look so great. He's saying this new body is going to be a whole new level of exciting when you get to put that on and experience what God has in store for you. Verse 3, for we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. This directly contradicts that belief that so many people have that their relatives float around as bodiless spirits. That's not what the Bible tells us. Verse 4, while we live in these earthly bodies that wear out, these tents that are temporary, we groan and sigh, and it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. Isn't that an interesting turn of phrase? The body is not swallowed up by death. Like, we think it's swallowed up by Oh, it's corroded down to death. But Paul tells us instead that Jesus came to give us life. So our dying body is not swallowed by death, but by the life that he has come to give us. Praise God, right? We have life everlasting that we look forward to. Verse 5, God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. I love this promise that we have that the Holy Spirit inside of us is a guarantee that we are going to receive everything that is written about in the truth of God's Word. That we are going to receive that eternal life with God. Obviously, the Spirit of God is eternal. And so if that Spirit of God is within us, then we too are going to be eternal spirits and souls. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident. There's a huge difference between a Christian who hopes that they're going to be with Jesus when they die and a Christian who knows that they are going to be with Jesus when they die. Several weeks ago, many of you remember Bonnie Thatcher spent several weeks in bed at 91 years old. And if you visited her, had a conversation with her, she was a woman who knew exactly where she was going. And she had this incredible confidence. She had this hope. There was no doubt about what was going to happen. She was ready. 
Every night she went to bed hoping that Jesus would take her because she knew that death meant she wasn't done. She knew that her body had worn out and she had an assurance of where she was going to be the moment that she ceased to take her, or the moment that her heart ceased to keep beating. That's what that assurance, that confidence looks like. And because of that, she could fully agree with the next statement that says, and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please Him. As followers of Jesus, what is our goal? To please God. That's so different than what so many other people make as their goal in life, right? This world, everybody thinks, well, I'll just live my life how I want to live my life. And they make goals of being, having a bigger bank account, being more comfortable in retirement, having lots of experiences. They want to be in great shape and make people think that they're younger than they actually are. These are all the goals that they set. They want to be successful or they want to be TikTok famous. And Scripture tells us, look, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have one goal. And that goal is to live your life in such a way that it pleases God. And there's a lot of room for you to enjoy life within that goal. But that's the goal that takes priority. Verse 10, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. This tells us that how you live your life on this earth ultimately is going to impact your eternity. And conversely, what you believe about eternity shapes how you are going to live today. That's a big thing to unpack. What you believe about what happens after you take your final breath. This concept some people are afraid to ever think about is so crucial to how you are going to order and live your life today. If you never think about it, and you're just like, you know what, I'm going to make the best of this world, and I'm just going to hope for the best when I die, you are taking a lot of risk. You are being naive and you're just hoping that you'll cross your fingers and be like, I hope it all works out somehow. I think that a lot of people are hoping that, you know, God just is kind and nice and gives everybody a free pass. But let's base our view of eternity on the truth of what God's Word says and not just what we hope it says, naively believing things that aren't actually in there. I want better than that for all of you. I want you to understand what eternity is going to be like and as a result, allow that to shape how you order your life today. That's why we're going through this series and we're going to unpack the truth about death. So when we're talking about what does Scripture say that is absolutely true that everybody agrees with about death, first is your physical body will die. Death and taxes, right? We all understand that. Those are the two things that you can't get out from. Hebrews 9.27 tells us that just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, it's very clear we are all destined to die once with the exception in the Scripture of Enoch and Elijah who both floated up to be with God. Everybody else through all of history has died once. Lazarus died twice. <laughs> All of us were destined to die once. Our physical bodies have not been made to be eternal. They have not been made permanent. They're like a pair of tires. The more miles that we put on them, the faster they're going to wear out. If you do hard work and you use your body in your job all the time, you understand that more than anybody. And eventually, unless the Lord returns first, all of us are going to have a final day in this skin. The temporary tent is going to wear out, as Scripture tells us, 
from dust to dust. That's just simply the truth. Then, the second thing that is a truth about death is that your soul will continue to exist. So your body wears out and it is done. But who you are has an eternal element to it. It's important to recognize there's this difference between our body and our soul. You are a lot more than the bones and the muscles and the organs and the tissues that make up your physical self. Yes, your physical will wear out, but you won't. Your soul, who you are, is going to continue to exist. That's exactly what Jesus tells Martha when he goes to her house after her brother Lazarus has died. She's kind of sad. She was hoping Jesus was going to get there before he died and heal him. But instead he died, and she's sad, and Jesus shows up, and they have a brief conversation, and this is part of that conversation. From John chapter 11, verse 25 through 26. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Do you see the contradiction there? And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Think about that. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. He's not disagreeing with the first point we made that your physical body is going to die. He's like, yep, that's going to happen. And yet, you will still live. That's where he's saying your body will die, but your soul will live. In fact, if you believe in me, your soul will never die. Through belief in Jesus, you can live forever. Not in this body that wears out. Praise God, because you'd have an eternity of aches and pains. He had a better plan than that for you. He gives you a new body, an imperishable body, one that we can't comprehend, that will never wear out. And so your soul in that new body will be with Jesus for all eternity in perfect union. Now, there's some debate as to what happens to your soul the absolute moment you die. A second after you, one minute after you die, the question is, are you with Jesus in heaven? The moment your heart stops beating and your mind stops thinking and you stop taking breath, where are you? And some people would say at that moment it's called soul sleep because there's a couple of verses in the New Testament that refer to death as sleep, kind of as an analogy. And so they would say that when a person dies, they're simply at rest until the moment when Jesus returns for his second coming. And at that time, everybody who has died will be united with Jesus all at a single moment together. But there's other passages, one even from Jesus, that seem to contradict that, and that'd be the side of the fence that I line up with a little more. So while Jesus was hanging on the cross, Scripture tells us that he had a criminal on his right and a criminal on his left. And as they're all hanging up there waiting to die, one criminal is jeering him, but the other one says to him, Jesus, remember me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus responds and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. Additionally, the Apostle Paul writes about how he sometimes wrestles in the midst of his suffering, wondering if it'd be better to just be killed by the people persecuting him or to continue suffering through and living as a witness for Jesus while being persecuted. He tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, he writes, For to me, to live is Christ... And to die is gain. That seems unusual. If I'm to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So Paul had this understanding that the moment you die, you are instantly with Jesus. So he seems to also teach that that instant you are with him. And based on these verses, I'm confident to say, one minute after you die, 
You are with your risen Savior. And that leads to our final truth about death. You're with God Almighty. You're with Jesus. And you are going to face judgment. That is a very clear truth in Scripture. Everybody is going to face judgment. Just like Hebrews 9.27 said, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, there's no getting out from that. In recent years, some people have tried to clean up the Bible, make it a little more palatable for non-Christians, make it a little cleaner, a little nicer, a little safer, and have minimized judgment. They either believe that God is love and so he won't judge anybody too harshly. Everybody gets an A for effort. Or they simply hope that he skips the whole judgment piece. And he just instead lets everybody into heaven and says, you know what, the door is open. Everybody come on in. But that's not the picture that scripture leaves us with. Remember, we have to shape what we believe about what happens the moment after we die, not based on what makes us feel good or what people have kind of talked about. We have to base it on what the Bible tells us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17 tells us, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Let's break that down a little bit. God judges each person's work. He doesn't just let people through without evaluating their lives. Every one of us is going to be judged some way or somehow when we get to heaven. God judges impartially. That means he shows no favoritism. That means nobody gets a free pass. It's going to be based on your works and what you've done. I'll explain that. I know some of you went, oh, that doesn't sound right. Let me keep going. So, live your lives with purpose. Recognize your time spent in this earthly body is a tent. It's temporary. It's short. And in the grand scheme of your eternal life, it's minimal. So make the most of it. Use every opportunity To please God, as should be your goal. To live with fear and respect of God in your heart. So, now speaking of judgment, here's what we need to understand. There are two judgments. There is a white throne judgment that is before God, and that is for non-Christians. And then there is the Bema seat judgment that is before Jesus Christ, and that is the judgment for Christians. So in the white throne judgment, we read about this in Revelations chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Here's what it says. Then I saw, John was the apostle of Jesus, was being given visions by Jesus about what was going to happen at the end. He says, then I saw a great white throne, and him who is seated on it, The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. This is God the Father, God Almighty, because Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. The key to this passage is to understand this book of life. That is where the names of every person who have ever put their trust in Jesus has their name recorded. It's way more important than our church membership book, okay? This is Jesus' membership book. Who's a part of his family? Who has confidently said, Jesus, you are my Savior and my Lord? It's a big book. covers all of human history. And if you've recognized your sin and your need of a Savior and you've asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, all the ways that you've fallen short of God's perfection and his holiness, and you've committed your life to him, not just said, Jesus, I'm sorry, and I'm going to keep doing what I want to do, but you've actually said, and Jesus, I'm going to live my life to please you. I'm going to make you my master, my Lord, my king. Then your name is written in the book of life. 
But for those of whose names are not found in the book of life, those who have never committed their lives to following Jesus, Scripture tells us part of this white throne judgment is that they will be thrown into the lake of fire. They will experience eternity in hell. And that's our topic for next week, the horrors of hell. A lot of pictures people have that aren't biblical. We're going to look at what Scripture actually says. But what I find interesting about this white throne judgment is that people are judged according to what they have done. The problem for them all, as well as all of us, is that based on our actions, none of us deserve heaven. Nobody deserves it. So ultimately, they're judged completely fairly. God is fair. He looks at their lives. He looks at these other books that record all their deeds. And he says, you have fallen so short. And what separates those who have been thrown into the lake of fire and those who are not is not their deeds. All of our deeds say guilty. What separates us is that some of us have our name written in the book of life because we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. So ultimately, this is a judgment for non-Christians, for those whose names are not found in the book of life. And without the free gift of mercy and forgiveness that God gives us when we commit our lives to Jesus, these people earn their position, rightly so, in the lake of fire. That's not an unjust God. That is a holy, perfect, righteous God who's judging according to his righteous rule. And from our perspective, we can say, well, that doesn't seem fair, God. But the truth of the matter is God laid it all out. And we had the opportunity to live a perfect life, and we failed. So I understand this is an unpopular position nowadays, but it lines up with other teachings from Jesus. One incredibly sobering lesson Jesus teaches from his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, 21, he says these words as he's teaching a big group of people. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Church attendance, tithing, serving in the nursery, all of them are good things. None of them will save you. None of them. The only thing that matters is that Jesus knows you. That he has a relationship with you. And as a result, that your name is written in that book that saves you. Your connection with Jesus is what determines who judges you, and how you are judged. If you have no relationship with Jesus, then you're going to be judged by God Almighty in the great white throne judgment. He's going to open the book. He's going to not see your name. He's going to judge you by your actions, and he's going to say guilty. However, if you've put your trust in Jesus, and your name is found in the book of life, then we read about a different judgment, the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it was the last verse of what we were reading earlier. Here's what the NIV says. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. This is a different judgment for Christians. The judgment seat here uses a Greek word called the Bema seat, okay? The Bema seat was in Athens, okay, where the Olympics took place. And the Bema seat was where the court-martial of all the games would stand and judge the competitors after they had completed their contest. It's where the rewards were given out. To those who did exceptionally well, they were given one reward. And the, to those who did well but not as well, they were given a lesser reward. The Bema seat was where rewards were passed out based on performance. And so it's actually interesting here that Christians ju- are going to be judged, but it's going to be judged on how we followed through the things that 
Throughout the New Testament, God tells us ways we will be honored and blessed and we will receive glory for doing. It's not where a person is judged for their guilt or their innocence, but it's where they are rewarded for how they live their life in a way that pleased God. And so do you see how these two judgments work together? The white throne judgment determines who's saved and who goes into the lake of fire. The, then we have this Bema seat judgment that also looks at works, but not to determine guilt, but to determine reward. And so for those who put their faith in Jesus, they receive these rewards for what they do. Some examples of what we're rewarded for in Scripture is when we, how we treat the least of these. When you treat them with love and kindness, that passage that says, God, when did I ever visit the person in prison and feed the hungry? And he says, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. We've got this passage in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, when you pray, go close your door, don't be showy and let everybody know what you're doing. Then you will be rewarded by your heavenly Father. When you give, don't make a big deal of it. Then you will be rewarded by your heavenly Father. There's a special reward for people who keep what they do quiet and don't try to receive all the praise and accolades of man. How you deal with suffering and persecution, Scripture tells us you will be rewarded differently. How you, many people you share the gospel with, lives that are transformed, will be a reward for you in heaven. How great that will be when you get to heaven and one day you find out all the things you did that you didn't even know made a difference and you find out the impact you made in that kid's life by that small act of teaching Sunday school year after year. You find out that that gift you made to that mom who was having a hard time making ends meet got her through a hard time where she was thinking of ending it all. And ultimately, she found Jesus, and her whole family's life was transformed. I think we're going to find out how all those things play out. And we're going to be rewarded accordingly by the judgment seat of Christ, where he's passing out rewards for us. So the big idea between these two judgments is that we are saved by grace. Ultimately, we avoid the white throne judgment not because of our works, but because our name is in the book of life, because of God's grace and our faith. Does that make sense? You follow that? However, we are also rewarded for our works. There are two judgments, one for non-Christians, one for Christians. Saved by grace, but it's not that works don't matter at all. There is going to be a reward. And we should seek to live a way that pleases God, ultimately for our eternal selves. Receiving God's grace must come first because it's what saves you from an eternal judgment apart from God's presence. But some people stop there. And that's the problem with some people's faith is that they're satisfied with saved by grace and then they live the rest of their lives almost like they're trying to do the bare minimum. It's like the kid who's like, D's get degrees, mom. You know, as long as I got a 61%, I still pass and can keep playing sports. I still get my diploma. That's not how Jesus wants us to live. He wants more than that. And he offers rewards to us according to the way that we live in alignment with what he taught us to do. In fact, it's spelled out through the pages of Scripture for us. So in this world, we are all trying to figure out how to live. Every person on this face of this earth is trying to figure out how to live. What's the right way to do life? And some people are searching for adventure and fun and experiences and memories. Others are living their entire life encapsulated by their family. And so their kids' schedules and what their kids' wants and desires are completely dictate their lives. Others set their sights on success, whatever they define that to look like. But for Christians, we base our entire lives not on these other things, but on how we can please God. So really, how we live this life today is way more about, is about way more than just today. It's about our eternity with God. What you believe about eternity shapes how you live today. We said that earlier. That's 
the bottom line in this message today. Do you believe the verses I've shared with you? Do you believe that there's actually going to be a judgment? If you do, I hope that you've put your faith in Jesus so that you can experience that Bema seat judgment where Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's your reward for how you lived your life. And if you haven't made that decision yet, today's the day to say, do I actually believe what the pastor up front is telling me? Do I believe what all these scriptures we've walked through, that they're actually true? Because if they are, then how you live today is going to impact your tomorrow. And you have a decision to make. Are you going to rest on your laurels and just hope, well, I'm a pretty good person, I hope I make it. Or are you going to say, you know what, I believe that Jesus is the only way. I believe that it's by grace and faith in Him only because, yeah, my life is a mess. And if I were judged by God according to my works, I'm in trouble. If that's you today, I want you to seriously consider saying, Jesus, I need you to be the center of my life because what I'm doing for myself isn't cutting it. Just because you come to church on Sundays doesn't get your name in the book of life. Every single one of us has to make that decision. Jesus, are you my Lord? Are you my master? Are you my king? Am I going to live my life in alignment with what you have said? It's not because your parents brought you to church. It's not because you occasionally put money in the offering plate. It all comes down to, does he know you? Do you have relationship with him? My greatest fear is that you come to church for years and you hear the songs and you mumble through them and you listen to the messages and you put a few dollars in the offering plate and you serve on occasion and you never develop your own relationship with Jesus. You never put your trust in Him. And at the end of the day, you stand up in front of God and He says, I never knew you. Don't let that be your lot in life. Put your trust in Jesus. Everything in eternity is completely pivotal on what you do with this life today. So don't miss that moment. If you decide to make that decision to follow Jesus, I encourage you, come talk to me after this service. I want to talk with you. This is too big of a moment to just pass by and go, oh, another long sermon. Let's get to lunch. Okay? This is the heart of the gospel. This changes your destiny. Bow your heads with me as we pray.